All right, so getting back to our kingdom series, we have been exploring the kingdom of God uh, throughout our series this school year uh, and have a whole lot more that we're going to share and some things that we're going to change up and do differently here and there. Uh, but I am very excited to be sharing this with you because our vision at Hollywood Christian School is that we will become a catalyst for world-class kingdom to education. And I'm telling you, there's no better information you can get than understanding the kingdom of God. And so I am delighted to be able to share this word with you and be able to uh, get into the word together with you all as well. So our main question that we're trying to answer during today's session is how does a kingdom perspective of living differ from a worldly one? I mean, there are different ways that we can all look at the world. Uh, and, and a perspective is just something like a lens. It determines how you see the world around you, how you interpret the, the actions of others, how you deal with situations and circumstances that you find yourself in. All those things make up your perspective. And whenever we're talking about living a kingdom-centered life, we're talking about living a kingdom lifestyle and doing things from a kingdom perspective. So we want to compare that perspective to what it looks like when we don't have that perspective. Uh, because when Jesus taught the kingdom, one of the things he did was he completely flipped the script about what we thought was true concerning life itself. And there's a whole life that we live when we come into the kingdom of God that can oftentimes be very different from the lives of other people that we see around us. And if we don't grasp that truth, if we don't understand it and we don't believe it, sometimes we can struggle in our faith. And let's face it, one of the biggest things that you all have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, whether you're in a Christian setting or a non-Christian setting, is the pressure of the peers around you. There's this natural inclination towards wanting to be like others. That's this natural instinct that you have to want to do what you see other people doing, to fit in the crowd. But when we live a kingdom lifestyle, it causes us to rethink that mental map that we have in us of always wanting to fit in. Because when you're trying to live a kingdom lifestyle, automatically you're going to stand out because your life and your lifestyle is so different than others around you. If you have your Bibles, you can look at Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 1. We started on some of this uh, last week, but we didn't quite get finished, and I want to pick back up on it this week. But in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, if you remember, we read, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who persecute, for, who persecute you for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. With this message, Jesus gave some very hopeless people a lot of hope. He gave some very weakened people a lot of strength. And he gave some very discouraged people a lot of encouragement. Because here's one thing that's true about the kingdom of God versus the world that we live in. In the world that we live in, people try to teach you to get ahead by stepping on others. I get ahead by making other people look worse than myself or whatever the cost may be. It doesn't matter who feelings I have to hurt. It doesn't matter who I have to crush, who I have to step on. There's this rat race to the top. And it doesn't matter what, what I do to get there as long as I get there to the top. But in the kingdom of God, God flipped this whole entire thing around. And the Bible says that God has the capacity, the ability, and the desire to use the weak to shame the strong. He has this ability and desire to take what we consider to be unimportant and make it important. In other words, God will use people that we discount. God will use people that we set aside and say that they're nothing and that they're nobody. God will use the person that you've been bullying to change your life. God will use the person that you pick on every day to one day be your boss. And trust me, that stuff happens. That's why you should never make fun of nerds because nerds eventually become bosses. I'm telling you now, 
You can pick on the day. You can, you can make people feel bad about being smart, but there will come a day when that individual that you're talking about, that individual you're making fun of because he can answer every question the teacher asks, because she makes 100 on every single thing the teacher gives to her to do, you can make that person feel low not because they're so much smarter than everybody else, but there will come a day when that person will stand in front of you as your boss or as your judge. I'm telling you that day will come. So be careful who you pick on now because tomorrow that person will probably be your boss. God will use people that we want. God will elevate people that we want. God will promote people that we want. God looks at people differently than how we look at them. We tend to judge people by outward appearance, how they dress, the car that they drive, the house they live in, how much money they have. We tend to judge people by outward appearance, but God judges people by the heart. So it's not a matter of who you are better than. What matters most is what's in your heart. What matters most is what's in your mind. What matters most are the principles that you live by. What matters most are the habits for success that you have in your life. Not necessarily how it looks right now. Y'all ever heard of a man named Sam Walton? Y'all ever heard of him? Anybody? Nobody? The teachers? How many of y'all ever heard of Walmart? More people, right? Even though you ain't raising your hand. Y'all have probably been to Walmart at some point in your life one of the biggest companies in this country. Well, if you would have met Sam Walton, who was a billionaire, you'd have met him. You would have never thought that this man was a billionaire. He drove around in his old checkered shirt with some overalls and a beat up pickup truck. He looked just as broke as a homeless person. And yet he was a billionaire. Because his life was not determined by how he looked. His life was determined by the ideas that he has. The most valuable possession you have right now are your ideas. The most valuable possession you have right now is the vision you have for your future. The most valuable possession you have right now are the deep desires and passions that are in your heart. And our goal and our purpose is to help draw those things out and help you define them. So with these Beatitudes, which is what we call those verses we just read, Jesus basically flipped the script. He said, you think life is this way, but let me tell you who is really and truly blessed. And there are several things we get from that. Here's the first one. The first one is the standards of kingdom living are contrary to the standards of the world. The standards of kingdom living are contrary to the standards of of the world. Right off the gate, you're going to be different. Right off the gate, you're going to think differently. Some of you are going to graduate from Hollywood Christian School and you're going to go off to college. Some of you may go to Christian schools and, you know, you may see some of the similar mindsets that you have have here at HCS. Some of you might not. Some of you may go off to a public university. Some of you may go off to a community college that might not have the same beliefs that we have at HCS. And you're going to run into some mindsets. You're going to run into some beliefs that are different from what you believe. And you have to be strong enough to know that I know that this is what my God has said. I know that this is what's true. And I know that this is what I believe for my life. You got to be able to be well rooted in who you are as an individual. Because the very minute you step into a public setting that's different than this one, you're going to feel a resistance against you. You all are growing up in an age where people are becoming antagonistic toward Christians. People get frustrated just hearing you talk about your God. People get mad at you because you quote scripture. People make you feel bad because of what you believe. You're you're living in a world and you're growing up in a world where people no longer care so easily about it. They'll tell you, put up with this. You know, put up with, with homosexuality. They say, put up with gay marriage. They say, put up with all of this other stuff that, that we're going to run, but, but we won't put up with you. Put up with all the other religions, people blowing people up because of their, their faith and their beliefs. Put up with all of that, but they won't put up with you. You're living in a world that's going to be automatically against you. Your standards are going to be contrary to the standards of this world. Here's the second thing. Kingdom citizens must be content with living differently. You got to learn to be comfortable 
with being different. If you look around this room right now, there's absolutely no evidence that says you got to be the exact same way as everybody else. Look around this room, there's nobody else in this room who looks like you, is it? If it wasn't for the uniform you were wearing, I could even say there's nobody else in this room who is dressed like you. There's nobody in this room who walks like you. There's nobody in this room who talks like you. There's nobody in this room who thinks just like you. So by your very design, you're different. You're meant to be different. So you're really working too hard when you're trying your best to fit in and make sure that everybody accepts you. You have to be content with who you are and you have to be comfortable with being different. You're going to stand out in this world. So we, kingdom citizens have to be comfortable with being different. Uh, because number one, your culture is different. When it comes to kingdom citizens, their culture is different. Now, a culture is simply a mental map of the world, how you figure things out, how you make decisions. Hey, let me give you a simple example. It's lame, but it's a good one. Right now, you're sitting down and you're listening to me. You're not getting up and being rude. You're not doing disrespectful stuff. You're, not, you're sitting here, you're being patient, you're being respectful, and you're waiting for me to get through the chapel lesson for today. Now, I didn't get up here and tell you to do that. You did it instinctively. We didn't have to tell you to come in and sit down and be quiet and get ready for chapel. You already knew that because you understand the culture, you understand the atmosphere, you understand the environment that you're in, and so you know how you're supposed to be. You know how you're supposed to behave. That's a part of your mental map. That's a part of your culture, how you make sense of the world around you. When you get in your car and you drive down the right-hand side of the road, the reason why you drive down the right-hand side of the road is not because somebody told you to, but because you picked it up from the culture in which you live. It's how you are designed. It's how you function. It's just your mental map for making sense of the world around you. For kingdom citizens, your culture is very different. Your whole entire culture is very different. Culture, for example, is made up of values. For kingdom citizens, their values are different. Values are things that you believe are important. People in the world value stuff like money. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Money has its place. Money has its position where the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It didn't say that money was evil. It said that the love of money is the root of all evil. When you allow money to have you instead of you having money, that's when the problem be begins to start. So the things that people value in this world will be different from what you value. The most wealthy thing you can have, the most expensive thing you can have in the kingdom of God is wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Those are things that are valuable. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 8 that those things are more precious than jewels, which means that it's more valuable than the most valuable possessions on earth. Having knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in the kingdom of God is more valuable than anything. This is why it's important for you to respect and honor your teachers. Because they're, they're not just giving you information for a test. They're giving you knowledge. They're giving you wisdom. They're giving you understanding. They're giving you the most important thing. But oftentimes, that most important thing is the thing that's ignored the most. Why? Because I can't take that knowledge right now and I can't run to Walmart and buy me something with that knowledge. So we discount it because we can't see the importance of it right now. But the Bible says that a wise man stores up knowledge because he recognizes that there is value in what I am getting. And so you have to understand that the very thing that we oftentimes discount as not being the, the important thing in the room is the most valuable thing that we can ever possess. So their values are different. What we value in the kingdom of God is just simply different. The norms are different. Norms are things that you do on an everyday basis, things that you do, your routines, your rituals, your patterns, things that you do on a regular basis. There will be times when you just simply don't do what everybody else does. I, I am 35 years old. I've, I've never been to a club a day in my life. Why? Not because I can't do it, 
but because that's not an environment that's going to be conducive for what God is wanting to do in my life. That environment doesn't work for me. It doesn't fulfill my goals. It doesn't help move me closer to God. It's not the environment I want to be in. So there will be times when you just simply don't do what everybody else around you does. Their norms are different. Here's another one. Their celebrations are different. Be careful about what you celebrate because whatever you celebrate, you accept. Let me give you an example that's fiction to get ready to come up. Halloween. Now, I'm probably going to hurt some of your feelings and maybe some of your parents' feelings, but that's beside the point. If you look at the history of Halloween and what it is attached to, you will discover that there are some very evil roots associated with Halloween. Now, you, the first response you get from that, and, and I'm talking about with Christians, people who call the name of the Lord, is, you know, it's just, it's just having fun. You know, you just, ain't nothing wrong with putting on a costume, ain't nothing wrong with, with doing anything. It's just fun. But let me tell you something, and you better write this down. There is no such thing as harmless fun. There is no such thing as harmless fun. Stop letting people fool you. There is no such thing. If you celebrate something, you are accepting it. And there are too many things and stuff like Halloween that just goes against what we know we believe. But it's hard for some Christians, for some believers, to watch all of their friends run around with the costumes on and get candy and do all this stuff because it looks fun and I want candy and I just want to do it. Oh, what you celebrate, you accept. Even if you tell yourself, this is just harmless fun. No, it's not. You are participating in something that has evil roots. What does the Easter Bunny have to do with the resurrection of Christ? I'm waiting. Read the story of the resurrection. Where do you find an Easter Bunny? And what's even worse, when did Easter Bunnies start laying eggs? I've never seen a rabbit lay an egg. None of that stuff makes sense to me. So I don't celebrate it because it has nothing to do with Jesus. But if you look at the history of Easter, you'll find that it's associated with pagan worship, worship of a false god. So we've taken the worship of a false god and we've attached it to a celebration of a real god and we get mixed up in all this mess. So be careful what you celebrate because what you celebrate, you accept. There is no such thing as homeless fun. Here's another one. Their relationships are different. How we relate to one another in the kingdom of God is different than how the people in the world relate to one another. Give me your first response to this. If somebody hits you, you do what? Yeah. That's your natural instinct. Somebody hit you, you hit them back. That's natural. But in the kingdom of God, you live a supernatural life because you have to listen to what Jesus taught you. Jesus said, if any man hit you side your right cheek, what do you do? You, you turn the other one. Now, there's a part of you that said, ain't no way in the world I'm going to do that. Well, ain't no way in the world you're going to be fit for the kingdom because that's a totally different mindset than the earthly world around me. Now, the Bible does say that there is a time and a season for everything. There is a time to fight. There is a time not to fight. Ain't nothing wrong with fighting if you're fighting over the right thing. Y'all hit me on that. But, but fighting because somebody said something about you, that's just petty. And, and it shows that you're a weak human being. Somebody can say something and get you stirred up and make you fight. That's weak. That's immature. That ain't nothing to be fighting over. I'm better than that. I'm bigger than that. I'm more mature than that. You can't make me fight because you said something about me. And listen, I grew up in the yo mama days. We invented yo mama jokes. We start yo mama jokes and next thing you know, you about to get in a fight because something they said about your mama and you could they didn't hit a nerve. I grew up in those days. And I'm here to tell you, it doesn't work. So Jesus gives us a completely different lifestyle. We relate to each other differently. 
We relate to one another with love, with forgiveness, with compassion, with kindness. That's how we function. Our whole entire attitude towards one another is simply different. We don't function that way, we don't act that way. So their relationships are different. Not only that, their lives are different. They simply live a different lifestyle. They have a different sense of purpose, they have a different sense of vision, and they have a different sense of function. Kingdom people have a strong sense of purpose. They know why they're here. They know what they're supposed to be doing. They know what they're supposed to be accomplishing. They have a strong sense of vision. Kingdom people can see their success even before it happens. They have a strong sense of function. In other words, they know their gifts. They know their talents. They know their abilities. They know how God has designed them. Their lives are not perfect, but progressive. The lives are not perfect, but they're progressive. When we talk about all this kingdom stuff and how God wants us to be and how God wants to live, I don't want to ever give you the impression that God expects you to be perfect. That's not going to happen. Because, and, and first of all, in order to be perfect, you would have had to have always been perfect. If you have any type of imperfection in your past and you never make another mistake in your future, you will still not be perfect because your past is a part of who you are. Therefore, you cannot be perfect. The only way you can be perfect, you have to be born perfect and stay perfect your whole entire life and die perfect. It ain't going to happen. The point is not to be perfect. The point is to keep growing. The point is to keep getting better. Yes, we mess up. Yes, we fall short. Yes, we make mistakes. Yes, we all do stupid stuff. Look at your teachers in this room. Every last one of them at some point in their life did something stupid. You may not think that right now, it may not look like that right now, but at some point in their life, they did something stupid. You're going to do something stupid. And when you do something stupid, you're going to get up, you're going to get over it, and you're going to move on. Do y'all hear me? That's how life works. We learn from our mistakes. So their lives are not perfect, but they are progressive. I'm running out of time. I'm not going to be able to finish everything, but let's, let's get through these last few points. Here's something else. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus said this, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And then he goes on and says this, nor do people light a lamp and put it on the basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, Jesus makes some very important statements there because, first of all, he used the term salt. Salt does two things. It enhances and it preserves. Your purpose in life as an effective kingdom citizen is to enhance and preserve the lives of others. You make other people's lives better, and you help other people maintain their purpose for life. That's what you do. This is why being rude to people is so bad. This is why being disrespectful to people is so bad, because you were never designed to hurt people. You were never designed to hinder life in people. You were designed to make other people better than yourself. Let me say that again. You were designed to make other people better than yourself. The reason why I'm standing right here in front of you is because I want you to be better than me. I want you to be better than me. I don't want you making the same mistakes I made. I don't want you falling into the same foolishness I fell into. There was a, a man who once said, said, and I remember it from my college years, he said, if I have seen further than any man, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And what he meant by that is that his wisdom came from the fact that he learned from some very important people who went before him. Here's my goal. My goal is to be your giant. My goal is to give you shoulders to stand on. Everything I've learned in my 35 years of life that has helped me to be successful, I want you to have it all before you turn 18 years old. So you live your life twice as good as I did. I want you to have it all. 
because I want you to be better than me. I want to enhance your life, and I want to preserve it. Second thing, the life of a kingdom citizen brings glory to the king. The life of a kingdom citizen brings glory to the king. And this is where you step back, and your life has to get personal at this point. Everything you do in life should bring glory to God. Everything you do in life should bring glory to God. The Bible says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Do it like you're doing it for God. And listen, I know this ex- these are lame examples, but it's true. You got to get this. I'm telling you. This is why some people never make it out of poverty. When you study, you study as unto the Lord. When you take tests, you take tests as unto the Lord. When you're sitting in classroom and you're learning, you learn as unto the Lord. I had a whole bunch of friends that I grew up with, a whole bunch of them. And, and listen to me. I can count on one hand right now how many of those friends made it out of where we lived at. We lived in the ghetto growing up. Very, some of them died. Some of them were in jail. Some of them just hadn't got anywhere. And there are a handful of us who made it out and have been successful in life. Just a few of us. Here's the number one difference. It was our desire to get the knowledge we needed to live a successful life. All the knowledge we needed. And all that knowledge included knowledge of God. It included book knowledge. It included street knowledge. It included any kind of knowledge we can get our hands on. The thing that made the difference was the stuff that you're getting exposed to in your classroom every day. It made a difference. That one thing made a difference. I can look at all of my friends who are still stuck in poverty, who still, even at 35, have not gotten anywhere in life. I can look at them and I can tell you the number one reason why they did not make it out is because they had a lack of a desire to get the knowledge they needed to be successful. It doesn't mean you have to go out and get a doctorate degree, but it means you got to get the right knowledge. You got to get the right knowledge that matches the purpose that God has given you in your life, the right knowledge. You get the right knowledge and your life will be successful. As kingdom citizens, we must adapt to but not adopt the ways of the world in order to remain effective. You're going to be exposed to a lot of different things, a lot of different people, a lot of different mindsets. You adapt to the things around you, not adopt. The stuff you hear in your music, the stuff you see on television, you adapt to those things, but you don't adopt them. That means that you take the message God has given you, you take the way that he has told you to live, and you adapt your life so that you survive without adopting and accepting the things that are around you. That's going to make you effective, and that's going to keep you effective for a very long time. One of the things I'm always doing is I'm always trying to adapt who I am to what's going on in the world around me so that I remain effective, so that I remain that salt, so that I remain relevant, so that I remain that light in the world around me. And I'm going to encourage you this morning, don't neglect the treasures that God is putting in your lap every single day. Don't neglect the wisdom that you've been exposed to all the time. Don't neglect those things. It makes the difference between a successful and an unsuccessful life.